Hey, there we go. Okay, thanks for coming. It's exciting to be in Mexico City talking about lightning, slicing, and uh, privacy in general. Uh, I'm Dusty. This is a photo of me when I'm much younger. A little bit younger, but that number is growing every year, it turns out. Um, so a little bit about me. I've been doing like Bitcoin development stuff for probably five years. And about a year or a change ago, I decided to focus on doing lightning stuff. And uh, my first big project has been splicing. Okay, so uh, who here is like technical? Raise your hand, like technical experience. Okay, who runs a lightning node? Okay, like half. Well, who was lighting out with more than one channel in it? Okay, same, cool. So we're gonna go over some of the lightning basics, and then we're gonna get into some of the more... Who runs core lightning? Oh, who runs core lightning? That's a great question. Ooh, hey, hey, there we go. CLN maximalism. Let's go, I love it. So I'm gonna go over some of the basics of lightning, which if, you've, if you might already know this, or you watched my talk, I covered this before, but we're gonna go over it briefly just for people that don't know, and then we're gonna get into some of the more detailed stuff relating to, to privacy. So if you imagine here, we have a, a, a mock lightning network. Uh, each of these little you know, well-drawn boxes are the lightning nodes, and they have channels between them. So when you want to make a payment through lightning, you have to route it across these channels to get it to where you want to go. As you can see this little Bitcoin moving to where it's trying to go. So, when we talk about working on Lightning, uh, all of the work, the development work, is on an individual channel. Um, that's what we focus on. But the end result creates this mesh. So we're going to dive into just what a channel is for a second. An important thing you might not know about a channel is that it has an actual size. So when you open a channel, it's set to a certain size. That size could be big, or it could be small. Um, and what that size matters is if you're trying to route uh, a larger payment that's bigger than the size of the channel, it won't be able to go through. So, if you want to make a larger payment, you're going to need a bigger channel. So, the problem there is that lighting channels can't be resized. So that the size is set it's done forever, um, so you can't push things through until now with the splicing. Much to the happiness of many uh, node operators. Okay, so what does splicing give us? The main thing, the most obvious one, is channel increasing, increasing channel sizes. Um, and here's a great image of that. Here it's bigger, now the payment can go through. But what's become more apparent over time is that splicing gives us all these ancillary benefits that weren't exactly obvious at first. One of them, uh, it feels like a left turn perhaps, but is actually building a universal wallet. So today, if you're using a, a Bitcoin wallet that's self-custody on your phone, you typically are going to have two balances. You're going to have your Lightning balance, and then you're going to have your on-chain balance. And this is a UX challenge for onboarding new users to manage like, what those words mean. Like If you're new to Bitcoin, you get the phone app, and you have to learn what those things are. That's a challenge. So with splicing, it enables us to build wallets where all of the balance is on Lightning, and we can use what's called a splice out to make on-chain payments. So this should cl clean up a lot of the user experience of users. So, uh, to give you more on that, the idea of using a splice to make an on-chain payment is you're going to splice out and decrease the size of that lightning channel by whatever the payment amount you want to do. So you can see here I have my on-chain or bust arrow, and if we move the Bitcoin out, we'll see the lightning channel get smaller by the amount of the, the size of payment. So in this way, you can now make on-chain payments from your Lightning balance, which I think is pretty awesome. The other great, goal, great use case for it is uh, channel cross-sizing. So if you're, if you're running a Lightning routing node, you're often in the scenario where you have one very valuable channel that gets lots of routing going through it, and then a bunch of partially dead channels that aren't getting much traffic at all. And with splicing, you can move funds from one of the dead channels over to the better channel, um, and making it bigger, and that takes your debt liquidity and makes it useful somewhere. You can do this all without ever taking any of the channels down, so they're out for the entire time. So, no channel down, that's a key point, no channel down time. Uh, the other point, which we're going to cover a lot more later, is you can do these in a way that's a lot like a coin join. 
So these splices get mixed with other details and merge into a single transaction. So in this instance, we have three different splices you're trying to do between different channels. You can merge them into a single Bitcoin transaction, which has, which has a lot of benefits, like both with transaction size and potentially some privacy benefits as well. Um, some other examples of things you can do is you could take, if you have one big lightning channel, you take the funds out of there, move into three different lightning channels, all with one transaction using splicing. You could also uh, take a fourth thing and move some funds on chain at the same time. So you could do all of these things in single transactions, which is sort of what is the main value of these cases of splicing. Uh, now, just going through some of the examples, you could take your on-chain balance and splice into three channels at the same time. You could do that and also make an on-chain payment at the same time. You could go from two lightning channels to three, throw in an on-chain destination. Sort of the point is, um, you could do a lot of things. There's almost endless ways you can combine these things together into uh, a lot of awesomeness. Okay, uh, who here has heard of collaborative transactions or interactive transactions? Cool, okay. These are, are, are very exciting. Um, this is a way, it's a protocol for nodes to build transactions together. So if we take an example, here we have two nodes, and let's say one of them wants to do a splice. It tells its peer that it wants to do a splice. The other peer could say, hey, I want to open a channel. And with the collaborative transaction protocol, they can decide to do it together. So when they do that, they then take their, their payloads, the splice payload and the open channel payload, merge them into a single transaction. And then when that gets confirmed, they both get what they wanted through the same transaction. So this gives us a lot of flexibility with how we build transactions and allows us to, uh, to make them into one. Okay, Who's, how's everyone feeling? Is this all making sense so far? Raise your hand if it's not making sense. Great, okay, you're either all shy or all following, I love it. Okay, so, uh, just to really drill this home, you can, it doesn't stop there. Say there's a third node that wants to like make an on-chain payment. They can all three do it together. And in that case, it still again gets put into one single transaction, combine the open channel payload, the splice payload, the payment, and they all, they all get it done. So, collaborative transactions, uh, otherwise called interactive transactions, is this idea of building transactions among multiple peers, and it's designed to be extensible. So right now, this is used with uh, dual opening, dual funding, sometimes it's called, and it's also used with splicing. Um, but it can be used with more things in the future. Like, one notable thing that comes to mind is uh, dual closing will use it, and potentially, Coin join services could join into it as well. It can be used for anything. It's a totally open, uncontrolled protocol. Okay, so how do you find peers to do this with? You do it with Lightning Network. So it turns out, like, the Lightning Network works perfect for this. We already have peer connections set up. If you use your existing Lightning peers to find peers to build a collaborative transaction with, it just is like a natural fit. So here's an example. We're gonna go through the last one we did, which is one guy wanted to do a splice, one guy wanted to open a channel, one guy wanted to do an on-chain payment. How does that work in practice? So we have one channel that says they'd like to splice, they tell their peer. That peer is, is there waiting with the thing it wants to do. It wanted to open a channel with this other node. It tells that node. And then that node has an opportunity to say, hey, I have this pending payment I want to do. I want to do that too. And then that gets relayed back to the initial one. You have the channel open and payment payloads are passed up to the first one. So, so those are four communications that happen in a row? Right? Yes. So we have uh, one, two, three, four. And there's actually going to be a fifth one that's going to be the next, which is the, uh, the middle node will also relay the splice request from the first one over. So in this way, every node in, the, in this particular collaborative transaction ends up getting all of the payload details, and they're passed from peer to peer. And, and does ordering matter here? Like when, which message gets sent when? The, the ordering, well, the, the ordering mostly doesn't matter, um, but you do have someone who starts it. So in this case, the top node here started the whole process, and the second middle node is responding to that request. 
So the second middle load will have some pending stuff that it wants to do, and it's going to try to save fees, but instead of doing it right away, it's going to wait till it gets incoming requests, and then add in what it wants to add to it. So the, the middle node waits for the answer until it coordinates with the right node, that, hey, let's open the channel. Yes. Then that right node is also waiting until it communicates, hey, I want to make the on-chain payment. Yes. And then those two bottom nodes are happy, so the middle node will talk to the top node. Exactly. Yep, that's the idea. I love it. Any more questions? Please feel free to not holler at any time. So, and then the end of this, uh, each node gets a copy of all. Oh, yeah. Um, so, does this also apply to channel closing transactions? You mentioned uh, moving dead liquidity to a uh, better channel. Could you just just split, like close that whole channel and just move it all the way over? Yes, asterisk. <laughs> uh, that, that's coming. Um, that's probably what I'm going to be working on after I finish splicing. Um, I don't know, you know, you give a name for it, what do you think? Splice to close, collaborative close, dual close? I'll think, I'll, I'll think about it. Okay, <laughs> awesome. Uh, yeah, that's, def that's definitely coming. And, uh, but that, that's, that's still in totally the idea stage. Uh, sorry, another question to the previous slide. Um, here, that, that right node, if he wants to make a payment, but the, the middle node does not talk to him to, make, to open it, to open a new channel. That new node could not be part of this whole construction. Correct. It's a response, so someone has to invite you, so to say. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. And you know, maybe at some point nodes will there'll be some kind of service that will they'll invite people just to invite them. There's nothing stopping that from happening. Uh, but as I suspect today, they, they would, there's no reason they'd be invited without a prompt. So one guy starts it, and then there's a chain of invitations on, until that's done. Yep. Exactly. Cool. So then, then each node gets a copy of all the payloads. They combine them into a single transaction again. And then once it gets confirmed on chain, um, we get the splice. We got, one guy gets his splice, the other guy gets his channel opened, and then the other guy gets his payment made. And it's all done in a single transaction. But in practice, this extends much further than just these three node examples. These are kind of to keep it simple. In practice, this can chain on for, for many, 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 many peers. So here's an example with, what is this, uh, six peers. And we have the same guy chart starting a splice. And then they're inviting other peers along their channels to do other things too. So this one is purposely a complicated example. We have a splice coming in, two splices, and a whole bunch of people trying to do payments. And they're all trying to get them done in this single collaborative transaction. Why do the later guys want to make the payments get invited? That might actually be a great point. <laughs> um, right, the current spec doesn't actually support this. That's an excellent point. Anyway, glossing over that. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so then then uh, then all of those get combined again into a single Bitcoin transaction, um, and in this uh, we have them all confirmed again. The splices, the payments all get confirmed in a single uh, transaction. So, all right, what about privacy? How does this work from a privacy perspective? So who knows what's happening in, in this uh, whole setup? Let's dive into the first peer. So what actually is this peer made aware of in this entire process? Okay, let's uh, zoom into it. That's the peer we're talking about. He started everything. Um, so he started out saying, I like to make a splice, he was aware of his own action, talked to that node, and then what he got back was a request to do it, like to do a splice in 18 transactions. Um, and that's all he sees. That's all that that node knows. And there's no way for it to know about the other five nodes that are further down the path. And, and each of these 18 transaction outputs are registered separately. So it's, there's not just one batch request with, hey, I want to do these 18. Yeah, that's what Lisa said this yeah. earlier, but I, I'm not sure I understood the point, because whether it's batched or one by one, you still can't infer that it's all from one person or all from several people. I was confused about that. Yeah, that, that sounds correct. I mean, the actual protocol moves these outputs over one by one, uh, but my understanding is in practice there wouldn't be a way to tell anything from that. Yeah? They need to, yeah. Is, is the, yeah, so this sounds a lot like the V2 channel opening protocol, is it the same exact protocol, or is the V2 channel opening protocol a yes. particular implementation of this collaborative, like, thing? Well, I mean, yeah, it's, it's the same protocol, yeah. Okay. And, and that, there's a lot of benefits to being the same protocol, is that the, it makes it uh, work with it. 
So if you wanted to put a dual open v2 and a splice thing in the same transaction, because they're using the same protocol, that becomes possible. Okay, so basically you could, it's correct to say you can use the v2 channel opening protocol to do channel splicing. You could do them at the same time. We gave it, so we gave that particular, the, the reusable part of this protocol, we gave the name interactive transaction construction. Okay. That part is used both in the v2 of open and in the splicing protocol. Gotcha, okay. So, so v2 the, opens are like a specific kind of there's the use setup, case for the, the channel. The setup is different. The information that you exchange is set up is slightly different. But the actual part of sharing the parts of the transaction is identical to the splicing. Awesome. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, when you first said, who knows what the interactive channel uh, <laughs> transaction construction protocol is, like, I might know what that is. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> so, so just for the recording, the, the, the question was, uh, could you use dual open to do splicing? And the answer is kind of mostly no, with a little bit of yes. There's a piece of V2 channel opens that uses the interactive protocol, transfer protocol, the splicing also uses. So they're independent actions, the splicing and the open, but they can work together to create a single transaction. So you can't do both at the same time, even though they're using the same protocol? Oh, you can definitely do it at the same time, yeah. So yeah, I guess this kind of depends how you define, are they the same? So the question is, can you do it at the same time? Yeah, so if you're running a node and you want to do a splice and a channel open, you would do both of them and then merge the data together. Okay, but, but I mean, you want to do diagrams if we have a, a channel open as one of these. these yeah, like the, the first node says, I want to do a splice, and then the second and third node say, we want to do a dual open. Oh, yeah, you already said it. Said yeah, you can go back to there. No, but it's definitely worth revisiting. Let's see. Yeah. So, yeah, he wants to do a splice, and I'd like to open a channel. And in this example, these are separate nodes, uh, but. So like your question, you're asking, can one node do both? And there's no reason they couldn't. There's like a lot of ways to spin this sort of stuff. All right, where, where were we? Okay, so we're diving into this node's experience. So it sees, it sees that it gets back to do the splice and 18 transactions. Um, yeah. What about the timing of these 18 transaction requests? And might there be some timing effects with regards to Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. This is as yes, definitively. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I imagine an implementation could could do things to mitigate those, but they're not. There's something in the in the spec that would prevent uh, timing inference of information. Yeah. I mean, there's other things you can do. So the spec supports like adding and subtracting things. So you could add fake stuff and then remove it later. I guess. It's like, I guess there's like, I mean, yeah. Yeah, that'd be interesting. So there's, there is a possibility to really kind of mess with it. I mean, I guess if you know what to remove, you, whatever, but anyway. But so for the mic, just what Lisa's saying is that you can do this, you can add in something to the to the splice transaction and then remove it again later, or maybe add it again, and there's maybe some griefing potentials from there. Yeah, so you add an output and then you remove an output. You could remove an output, yeah. There's a way to add in and remove stuff, yeah. Or, or you could also just say, I pass. And then on the next round, you could be like, oh, actually, I have more. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you risk, the risk with that is that your peer ends it before you, you yeah. do, but yeah. Yeah. But yes, yes, 100%. Yeah. Yeah, that might work, might not. Depends. Yeah, like, if you say you're done and they say they're done, then you lose that opportunity. But, like, you have a chance that they might. And it's probably worth exploring how one might grief at these scenarios, but. Sorry to interrupt you, but Max, what's the timing exactly? Exactly, so that some one of these other guys who's making extra payments, you're seeing it happening. Who's who seeing what? I guess. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing, uh, like the longer this chain is, yeah. the the longer it oh, will it has, take. It has to pass through the other guys. It, exactly, and oh, so. I was thinking like globally. Uh, 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 observation. Yeah. yeah, within the path. Within the path. Yeah. Okay, okay. Makes sense. So, like, the difference would be if the the one example is here. You have a long chain, yeah. versus the other thing is. It's still just the three nodes, and the third node wants to make. If it was hub and spoke, you wouldn't have that concern, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe you got a random delay on purpose. It's interesting questions. Anyway, moving on. Um, so just to kind of really drive this point home, like if you're before this node that circled, did our peer below do all of these things? Did it add 18, 18 payments and, and do a splice? Uh, we don't know. It could be either. It could have done it, it could not have done. 
So you end up with a plausible deniability where even, even if you're going just one hop and they're doing stuff, they might have done other hops that you don't know about. So if they're literally just doing their own stuff, you don't know that it's them. If they're doing other people's stuff, you don't know that it's other people's, it could, could be theirs. So it creates this plausible deniability. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, that, that's like that's that's mainly the talk I wanted to cover. If you want to go into more technical stuff, we can do that. Uh, but I wanted to go over any questions. Does anybody? Yes. Yeah, I was wondering if you could maybe speak on the trade-offs between doing just a normal rebalance and using splice to achieve the same thing. Sure. Uh, with the the main difference is here, you can change the capacity of the channels. With rebalances, you can't. So, like, if you if you're trying to, let's say you have a node that has one channel unbalanced on one side this way and the opposite on the other, if you can do a rebalance to fix that, you're always going to want to do that first, assuming the price is right. Sometimes the rebalance will just cost you a fortune, it's not worth it, then it becomes cheaper to do something like on-chain like splicing. Um, but in general, like I think every node should try to do the rebalance first at some reasonable rate, and once that fails, you go to, you go to these like fallback options. And there will, I, think, I suspect there will always be positions in the Lightning Network where rebalancing will never be possible. And in practice, like, in practice, the circular rebalance is like kind of a mythical creature that everyone talks about existing, and like no one's actually seen it or used it, but they're like, ah, everyone else is using it, I think. <laughs> Yeah, it, yeah, in theory it does, and I'm sure people have found it, but like, I know one guy who literally has a computer, he has his computer set up where it just tries to rebalance like every five minutes of every day forever. <laughs> just like waiting for the brief moment of it popping open, um, which, here's what fixes this. Here's what, there are all kinds, like, there are people that have opened channels to my node that instantly, I call it instant nuke. Where I try and make my ch channel balanced, and then uh, immediately after balancing, it goes all the way back to entirely outbound from no, entirely outbound my end. So it's pay with move, does it? And um. A couple of other of these like big lightning payment processes instantly, like so I'll spend like 500 seconds balancing <laughs> channels, and then they'll just go back like that immediately, and then suddenly only got outbound to put it here. So yeah. It's trying to keep balance. So, I bet. I wonder if we get a mic on us. I just want to repeat what he said for the for the TV. He was saying that uh, he gets a good lightning channel going, he balances it, and then peers like Moon instantly unbalance it for him like every time. But well, it's pay with Moon, not the Moon oh, wallet. Pay with Moon. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, uh, are, your, are your fees high enough? Like maybe your fees are really low? Yeah, I raised them really high, and they tried to do a couple more, and took like twenty to a thousand. Wow. Most likely. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, cool. This works. Hi. Yeah, it does. Uh, I've got a question about the mechanics of splicing because I've been looking at this recently, thinking about well, I won't describe it, but 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 um, so when you splice, you've got a new transaction, so you've got to wait for it to confirm, right? So as I understood it, I think Christian Decker told me uh, that, that, that you, you sort of basically maintain the state in both the old and the new channel simultaneously. Right. And I was just, uh, I think maybe with these answers. Yesterday, but, but I'm not really sure. Like, is it like um, I'm worried that if uh, my particular use case, maybe both channel, well, anyway, because you've got to wait for it to confirm, it might take a while. Is there something screwy that can happen? Like, if payments are being forwarded through it and like capacity is different, I guess it's just, I think you said it was the minimum, uh, these are the two. That's right. What, the, whichever one, if it doesn't work on one of them, then it doesn't work. Is, is that yeah. basically how it works? So, you can, this, this process can take quite a while, right? Yep. Yeah. The, the idea is, uh, so splicing is changing the channel balance. Um, there's an old balance and a new balance. Whatever the lesser of the two is, then you're only allowed to wrap that amount until the splice confirms. Yeah, and, and the way they're done in parallel is, is in a typical lightning channel you have your, your funding transaction and then a pre-signed commitment transaction and a bunch of HDLCs in there. And then um, with splicing, you just duplicate that. You have your funding transaction, and you also have the splice transaction, which is a duplicate funding transaction, but it's still pending. And then you create a commitment transaction as a child of that one, and recreate everything the funding channel has. So it's essentially it's all duplicate. Yeah, thanks. It's definitely, I, I get it now. My, my particular use case is a bit weird. I have a, a, a 
protocol I'm trying to imagine where actually the two parties will sort of sign off on the splice, but then there'll be other stuff going on before they even broadcast it. Does that sound like it will cause a problem? Other stuff as in payments? Well, no, they're pre-signing a bunch of other transactions, and then other transactions get broadcast, and then this splice in is actually going to be delayed with a... I'm not even sure this is remotely feasible with a, with a time lock. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, maybe I should explain it to you. Yeah, it, sound, it sounds vague, like a grandfather pinning attack. Like, uh, what that is, is, is if in the splice transaction, you're adding in funds from on-chain, and those funds coming in aren't confirmed on chain. Yeah, yeah yes. and that, I think that we've updated the spec that's specifically not allowed yeah. Yeah, uh, I can see why, yeah. for these issues. So only confirmed coins can be added? Yes. Zero comp is not going to happen. <laughs> Stop trying to make zero comp happen. No, 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 it's not So the question is, is zero comp going to happen? <laughs> no, no comment. How about negative one conf channels? Can we do that? <laughs> What's up? Um, how about the ordering of the inputs and outputs of the final transaction? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so the question is, what, what is the ordering of them? And they're ordered uh, by serial IDs, which are randomly assigned. So it ends up being like de like deterministically in a, in a random order. Can you elaborate? Yeah. So every time you add an output. Um, you give it a serial ID, and then all the outputs have a serial ID, then you sort by those, and those are just chosen randomly. Is there a reason that you're thinking about that? Okay, so why, uh, but every peer needs to know the ordering. Yes. And, and so, so how does it, I still don't get how to reach consensus on the ordering. When I send an output, I also send it serial ID. Ah, so the, the person who registers the output also chooses a serial ID. Yes. And that's just nonce. Yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. And so the input's the same. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. But yeah, so it's, it's not designed to be secure against anything. It's just literally this is our deterministic way of determining the order of inputs and outputs of the final transaction. Uh -huh. But that means that the individual user can just choose a serial number, so they can just like choose the highest one and make sure that it's on the end of the list. We'll give it first. Yeah, but I mean, there is no benefit in being first. Because I can choose the highest serial number and make sure mine is in a specific position. I know it hasn't been right. to me economically, but I think privacy, it might screw up privacy, is what you're looking for. Interesting thought. Yeah. Is, is there anything? You know, I mean, I yeah, I haven't thought of it very much. I, mean, I suppose you could deterministically generate the nonces from the outputs themselves, the old point door address. Exactly. Yeah. It's an interesting thought. And, and how about blame attribution for failure to sign? Can you explain that? <laughs> <laughs> so, so we have a, a coin joint transactions with many inputs, uh, and the transaction is only valid if every single input signs it. So if one single input fails to sign the coin join, we have a denial of service. The transaction does not succeed. And, and so that could be... Yeah, and, and so the problem is, um, yeah, like, uh, you need to attribute that a certain person failed to sign, and then ban him from entering in the future, because otherwise you just keep on registering the same coin, and you keep on not signing, and for an indefinite amount of time you deny the service. Yeah, I think like, that's a great point, and I think like there's a couple of things there, in other words, signing order, um, but like, I, I, I believe the best way to do this is to blacklist actual UTXOs. But how do you find consensus on which UTXO to blacklist among all the peers? Well, you can just do it individually for your own node, but that's definitely an area where I, I, I don't believe there's anything in the actual spec about that. This is like more of a implementation specific sort of detail. Um, but there is a related thing, which is uh, the signing order, like who is supposed to sign first, um, and uh, which is kind of kind of related. And what we've come up to come, come to is the best idea, as as we understand it, is having the person who put in the least amount of Bitcoin into the transaction, like they have to sign first, and then you go up from there to the ones who put in the most and sign last. Well, why is signing order important? Uh, because there's a potential grief where you can purposely not sign to like lock up people's, just to, just to screw with them and make it so they have to double spend their UTXOs in order to get out of the risk of this thing confirming later sort of thing. Isn't it related to your point about blame? Because we know that determining signing order that's the guy who should sign next, and therefore we've got a blame. Yeah. Did I miss something? But if, if they have 
an honest reason not to sign, for example, because somebody else had an right. illegal output or something, you cannot distinguish between like them being honest and them being adversarial. But this could be done with anonymous credentials. I think that's Max's point. But who issues the anonymous credentials? Satoshi. <laughs> Coconut credentials, you could have a threshold issuance scheme that still uses homomorphic value commitments in exactly the same way as key verification ones. Wait, what? Um, oh, sorry. No, no. I was going to ask, so why would something like a commitment transaction work the way that channel opens and closes work, where everyone has to sign, has to pr like provide a valid signature where everyone can get their money out like before the, before the transaction even goes live? If you do that, there's places and periods of yeah. funding. So that happens before the transaction tickets go anywhere. So you do get you do get valid you would get valid signatures from your counterparty for the commitment transaction. I just want to relay for the recording. He was asking, um, what if people pre-sign the commitment transaction before doing this? And Lisa was saying, yes, they definitely do that already. So the transaction before you sign anything with the splice, you make sure all the commitments are signed correctly. Uh, before you do anything with the spli with the splicing so the, the threat with these coin join type constructs is not the which this is we're talking about coin join here effectively because everyone's contributing inputs is not economic. Like there's no risk of people getting their money. The loss here is like there is when you put money into a multi six. The threat here is that somebody just chooses not to sign and the whole protocol fails, and then you're losing either time, technical time value, of much. But you're losing time anyway. It's annoying, and you, know, you have to deal with that. Denial of service. I guess the, as yeah. the number of participants goes up, the risk of such attacks increases. Or just failures as well as attacks. Yeah. 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 And there's like, if you're a big lighting service provider and you only have so many UTXOs, this could be a concern for you kind of thing. But you're not losing money, you're just losing, um, there's just more clutter but keeps traffic kind of thing. Cool, yeah. Okay. So if you have no more questions, I think I'm over time already. So thank you so much.